If you've been with us at all this summer, I know summer feels like it's chopped up, coming and going. Well, how many weeks till school starts in this? Some of you kids should know. You should say very depressed. For four, is it three weeks? Three weeks? Moms are like, yes. Right? Kids are like, no. It, se- it seems like it's rushing away from us. But this summer, we've been in a series called What's in a Word? The transformation of words or verbs in the New Testament, uh, as spoken to Jesus and the writers of the New Testament. Last week, uh, Pastor Brian preached to us the words of Jesus, and the, our word was give. And the, the verse was Luke chapter 6, verse 38, I believe. Uh, give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we poured into your lap. lap. For with the measure you use, we measured back to you. And he talked to us about the, the heart of the gospel, the very center of our faith, is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, gave, giving. We serve a generous God who's given us all things. And so as people made in his image, saved by his grace, we should reflect his character. And it's not just with our treasure, it's with our whole lives, giving of our time, our words, our attention, ourselves to God and to other people. And we have a different word this morning. Before we get into that word, though, I want to ask you a little bit of a weird question, give you a quiz, which may seem like a non sequitur, but bear with me. Um, What is the greatest motivational speech ever given in human history? How would you determine that? Lots of words have been spoken, lots of speeches given. But what if you measure it by how memorable the lines from that speech are? Let's see how you do on this little quiz. Who said these words? I have a dream. That's an easy one. Four score and seven years ago. Abraham Lincoln, Gettysburg Address. Ask not what your country can do for you. John F. Kennedy. Was that his first his inaugural address, I believe? Uh, never, never, never give in. Winston Churchill. Not Jimmy Valvano, as somebody said last hour. But if he said it, he was quoting Churchill. The only thing we have to fear is... Fear itself. Spider, someone said. No, fear itself. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right? Or how about for you sports fans? Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Lou Gehrig. This is, this is going back a ways. The unexamined life is not worth living. It's not C.S. Lewis, gotcha. <laughs> Socrates, in his apology. How about this? Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry. This one you should all get. Tell our enemies. They may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Well, Mel Gibson, actually, but, you know, play William Wallace, yeah. We could make a long list of memorable quotes from speeches given, but what if we said, let's measure it not by how memorable the lines are, but by the impact that speech had. What, what results came as, uh, from that, those words? We might have a slightly different list. By any measurement, the words spoken by Jesus in Matthew 28 have to be among the most powerful, inspirational, and uh, world-changing ever uttered in, by human lips. However, I think one of the tragedies for many of us is that these words we're going to examine in a moment become for us just another list of great talks, great speeches, inspirational things. And it's not true. There's so much more. And so I would like to reintroduce you to these life-changing, world-altering, history-shaping words of Jesus in Matthew 28. Turn with me if you have your Bibles, or you can follow along on the screens to Matthew 28. We'll read verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And when Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. To the end of the age. I'm guessing those are familiar words to many of you. If you haven't read them or studied them, you've certainly heard them before. And verse 19 is our memory verse. You can go back to that memory verse for the week. Go, therefore. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And our word is go. Before we get to the word in that particular verse, let's, we need to back up and look a little bit at the context here. Countless sermons have been preached on the, the Great Commission, our, our mission, our marching orders from Jesus. The mandate. But it's a bit of a surprising start, if you're interested. To, to go back to verse 16 and 17. A surprising start to this, this ama- these amazing words. Notice, 11 disciples went to Galilee. Why 11? Weren't there 12? Why 11? Judas has betrayed Jesus and hung himself, so he hasn't been replaced. There's only 11. 11 go 
to the Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them, wherever that was, and they worshipped him, but you notice this, but some doubted. You ever seen that before? But some doubted. Why is that in there? Um, having risen from the grave, conquering death itself, and over weeks appearing to his disciples in various contexts, he tells the 11 closest followers of his to meet him at the mountain in Galilee. Some have speculated this was the Mount of Olives, but the Mount of Olives, if you've ever been to Israel or know your geography, it's right across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem, and that's in Judea. Galilee is the region far to the north in Israel. You'll see an image here of this mountain. But see that sharp uh, uh, peak on the left that's kind of in shadow? That's called Mount Arbel, not mentioned at all by name in the Bible. But um, this, you are right now, your, your reference point is, we are looking in this photograph. I took this photograph when my wife and I and Pastor Brian and Maureen had a chance to go to Israel this past spring. We're looking westward across the Sea of Galilee to Mount Arbel. That mountain dominates the landscape. You can't miss it. From there, you can see the Hill of Beatitudes where Jesus fed the 5,000 and, and preached the Sermon on the Mount. You can see Capernaum, the hometown of Peter, where he call, first called his disciples. And you can see, oh, not yet. And you can see all the other uh, cities there. But anyway, that, let's look at it. That's my wife. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> That's looking at us down from Mount Arbol to the Sea of Galilee, looking northward there. Um, I wanted you to get a sense. Many scholars believe this is the spot in Galilee. It's a can't-miss geological place. We don't know for sure, but I want you to get a sense of what this was like. He's told his disciples, right? He's met with them several times. They've seen his resurrection power. Thomas has put his hands in the nail holes, and all that's already happened. And now, this last face-to-face -face meeting in, in the flesh, before he ascends to heaven, he says, meet me at the mountain. Wherever it was, what takes place there was, it's almost comical if you think about it. Okay, but think about it. Conquered sin, death, and the grave. Now begins the movement to change the world. How are you going to do it, Jesus? What's your plan? Well, I got 11 guys. That's it? Well, there was some more, but these are the main ones. I thought you had 12. I did, but one of them betrayed me and hung himself. This is an auspicious beginning for a world-changing movement, isn't it? 11 guys. And it gets worse. What do they say in, in verse 17? Some of them doubted. Did you ever see that before? They show up to the mountain because he told them to. They see him and they worship him, but in the minds and hearts of some of those 11... There's doubt. Doubt! Have you ever thought, well, if I could just see, like, if, if I could have lived then and seen the risen Jesus, then, then my faith would be stronger than it is today. I think it's always been this way. Even among those who believe in him and try to follow him, there is doubt. I find that oddly encouraging. Do you? Even among the 11, there are seeds of doubt. By the way, just as an aside, if you are going to, people often claim, well, you can't trust the Gospels. They're not eyewitness testimony. They've been doctored over the centuries to sort of prop up this idea that Jesus has a God. If you were going to invent a history to begin your own religion, you would never write it this way. Eleven guys full of doubt on a mountain? That's not, I mean, why would you write that? There's so many little hints in here that what we're reading is historically accurate eyewitness account. Hard to change the world with 11 guys, half of which are doubting. If, if, he's really, if he's real, if this is the real thing, if this is God's plan. But I, I find it fascinating to look at how Jesus does or does not address the doubters. He's omniscient. He's God. He knows the doubt in their minds, right? He's not, he's not in the dark about this, that they have doubts. If it was me, I think I would say, okay, time out. You want to touch the nail hole again? What is your problem? It's me. Believe, right? He doesn't do that. He doesn't address it at all. He just moves straight on with his mission and his message. Why? Because, and this is, I hope you get this, if you get nothing else. Because the movement, the gospel movement, of which we're a part, a product, has never been dependent on the strength of his followers, but on his strength, power, and authority. You hear that? This whole thing has never been dependent on how much you believe and how much you do and how much I produce. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have strong faith and go on our love for God. We should. But... It depends on him, not me, not you. Which is why he says what he says next in a shocking declaration. Verse 17. So they, they, they worship some doubt. He shows up and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. You can't have the go of verse 19 without the all authority of verse 18. That's why we go. All authority. Now, in the ancient world, much like our culture, 
people tended to elevate those of great power and wealth to almost uh, divine status. We, we, the human heart has a tendency to worship money and power. It takes different forms today, but it's still the same issue, isn't it, in our culture? And it was that way in the first century. Think about the world into which these 11 guys are to, told to go. A world, the ancient world, the, the great pyramids of Egypt, the Colosseum in Rome, the might of the Roman legions, which they, which they knew all too well, the, the mind-blowing libraries of Alexandria. They're going to go into the world full of these monuments to human ingenuity, human power, wealth, and achievement. And Jesus is saying to them, don't be deceived. Remember this as you go. I want you to remember something. You're going to see a lot of impressive things, but that's not real power. That's not real authority. All authority belongs to me. Never forget that. You think that's a relevant message for us today? I think it is. In our world, we're erecting lots of monuments to human ingenuity, power, wealth. The world seems to change almost on a weekly basis. Our culture seems increasingly hostile to those who proclaim the truth of the gospel. You can feel marginalized or even doubtful. Accused, maybe, even. Jesus says to them, the eleven, and to us, don't be deceived. I know what it looks like out there. I know what you're tempted to believe. But never forget this one truth. I have all authority. That's not real power. All authority belongs to me. Don't be overawed or afraid or confused. I have all authority and power. Remember this as you go. I think that's an incredibly relevant message for me and for us. And then Jesus gives them a simple command. And there was a lot of alliteration here. I couldn't help myself. A simple command. It's because he has all authority and power that he can say, therefore go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, that make, we don't have a lot of time for this, but making disciples. I think in the church we've made a huge mistake. We've separated discipleship and made it into like a program. Well, I, I've, you know, I, I'm a disciple because I went through the six-week course, or I filled in the blanks, or I went through the year-long discipling program, and now I'm a disciple. As if first you become a Christian, then you take some class or achieve some higher level, and then you become a disciple. That's not biblical at all, friends. If I ask you, how many of you believe in Jesus, that he rose from the dead and died for your sins? I know many of you would say yes. If I ask you, how many of you are disciples? We don't ask that question. Perhaps we should. There's no, discipleship is not some like next level. God invited, all the word means is learner, follower. What Jesus is saying then is go into the world and teach people to follow me the way you're following me. Make disciples. Teach them everything I've commanded you. So in the church then, we, we, I think, confuse this. We gunk it up with a bunch of programs. I, I like programs. They're good. But if we understand all the things that we do, the missions trips, the children's ministries, all the stuff we do here, if we understand it right, why are we doing it? What is it for? To make disciples. To help men and women, children, all ages, know, love, and follow Jesus with their lives. That's it. That's what we're doing here. What we're supposed to be doing here. Never forget, Jesus says, I have all authority, and this is what I want with you, to follow me and to help others do the same. It's a very simple command. I think we complicate it sometimes. Now, then he says something that I want to, I want to dig into a little bit. He says, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we see that like as a label, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now you're born to the club, right? Put the label on them. You ever been to a baptism service here? You hear us use that phrase, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not, in our culture, names are labels. People name their kids whatever they want. They spell it however they want. They pay no attention to the rules of like, you know, spelling or phonics. They just, you know, but they just make up a name. Um, in the Old Testament, in the, in, the biblical, in, in the ancient world, in the biblical culture, names had something to do with the essence or very nature of a person. Notice Jesus says, not the names of Baptize them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three names in one name. We're talking about the Trinity here, which J.I. Packer said is the loftiest, most complicated and difficult concept the human mind has ever tried to understand. So we're not going to figure it out in the next 10 minutes. And I hesitate to even go here, but I think it's so important for us to understand something. Jesus says something very important here. He's not saying just slap a label on them. They belong to me. 
into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the, old, in the Bible, when people have their name changed, they have their essence, their being, their nature changed. When Jacob, the younger of the twins, Jacob and Esau, his name means heel grabber, usurper, because he came out second his whole life was trying to grab for what's his. He has his name changed to Israel after he wrestles with God. The word means one who wrestles with God. That's the nation of Israel, where they got, it, they got their name from. Or Simon, when Jesus calls him, he's a, a blustery, you know, self-important fisherman, and Jesus changed his name to Peter, Petros, the rock. And on and on it goes. Or if you want another example, in, 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 the, in the Old Testament, when God comes to Moses in Deuteronomy, he says, I want you to build a tabernacle. That's the tent of meeting, the place where God's presence dwelt and all the people would gather together to offer sacrifices before the temple was built, the, t- the tabernacle. He says, I want you to build it for me because I'm going to make my name dwell there. What does that mean? He's going to put a sign out front that says Yahweh's tent? Is that what he means? No. He means I'm going to put something of my essence, my nature, my very being in that place. My name will dwell there. Something of the glory of who I am will be there. Or later in Exodus 33, when Moses says, we're not going to go unless your name goes with us. Your being, your essence, something of who you are, God, goes with us. Or in Psalm 75, the psalmist says, we rejoice for your name is near. Your essence, your being, your nature is near. And later on, then the Israelites build the temple where God's presence dwells, his name dwells there. And then later in Ephesians, we're told we are now the temple. We. The temple is no more physical, it's spiritual. We're joined together in which his name dwells. Now let's go back and think of what does this mean then when Jesus says we are to baptize, be baptized into and baptize others into the name. And don't make a mistake, water baptism is a symbol of this spiritual reality. There's no magic in the water. Water doesn't make you something you're not. That's a symbol of what this is talking about. Baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. The Trinity. Into the very essence, being, and glory of God. All people were created in God's image, but we, that image has been marred by sin such that we're in trouble unless God comes to save us. And when we trust in his salvation, that's being baptized into his name. And something of the very nature and essence of God is imparted to us. See what Jesus is saying here? I have all authority. Go into the world. And behind this going, behind the Great Commission, is the very power of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. Again, I know it's hard to grasp. C.S. Lewis writes about this in uh, Mere Christianity in a chapter called The Three-Person God. And in The Three-Person God, he says, uh, it's hard to grasp what the Trinity is. And here's an example. We all know what one dimension is, right? A single line horizontal line, that's one dimension. Two dimensions would be what? A vertical line, a vertical axis. So you can have two dimensions, horizontal and vertical, but they're still flat. It's just flat lines, right? You take four of those, two horizontal, two, or two horizontal, two vertical, you make a square. But you need six of those shapes put together to make a cube, and that's three dimensions. Depth, shape, volume. Lewis says, how could a two-dimensional person or being possibly comprehend what's meant by a three-dimensional being? Your whole world is flat. All you have is horizontal and vertical. You know nothing about depth or shape, and so it would be impossible for you to comprehend what's meant by three dimensions. But that does not mean that three dimensions don't exist, that they're not rational, that they're not real or true. It just means you can't comprehend them because your whole world is flat. Lewis says, in a way, we live in a two-dimensional world, spiritually speaking, as human beings. Flat. There is depth, shape, weight and volume to God that we cannot comprehend. And because we compre- can't comprehend it, that doesn't mean it's not true, real, or rational. It just means we're limited. So God, in a sense, comes to us and says, there's, another, there's a dimension to me. Three beings in one. One God, three persons. Now, I know we could spend weeks, months, years on this and not plumb the depths of it, but I want to give you three, uh, three powerful implications of what the Trinity is for us. And I hope, I hope this, I know it's a lot of information here. I hope this is helpful to you. First, love is more important than achievement in the nature of God. It's not on the screen. Love is more important than achievement. What do I mean by that? If God is three persons in one, he's love. He is love. What that means is he exists in loving relationship within himself. If he were just a, a singular being, one, one in one, he'd need someone else to love because love is a relational concept. So God is love. Therefore, in the nature of God, love is more important than like what you produce or achieve. Second, 
Servanthood is what authority looks like inside of God's character. Serving, giving your life away for the good and glory of someone else. For example, inside the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, they're not demanding glory from each other. They're glorifying each other. They're serving each other, elevating each other. The Son glorifying the Father, the Father glorifying the Son, the Spirit pointing to the Son and glorifying the Father. They're all serving each other. So love is what God is. It's more important than what we produce or achieve. Servant, serving is how God exists. And third, dynamic action is central to God's being. To quote Lewis again, the most important difference between the Christian God and all other religions is that in Christianity, God is not a static thing, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama, almost, if you will not think me too irreverent, he says, a kind of dance. He's not depersonalizing God. He's saying God is not just a singular, impersonal being somewhere. He is activity and action in himself. Now, I know this, some of you are like, I, I can tell, some of you are going, what are we even talking about right now? Right? So let me just try to break this down a little bit. God in himself is love, service, and action. That's who he is. Now, what does that have to say to us when we're called to go? Created in the image of a loving, serving, dynamically act, dynamic activity God. We are called to go, love, service, and action. That's it what God calls us to do. Timothy Keller writes, I do not now nor will I ever fully comprehend the Trinity, but I would not want to live in a world where it wasn't true. I feel the same way. I can't get my mind around it, but I'm so glad it's who he is. So we have a surprising start. 11 guys, some of them are doubters. Uh, this shocking declaration, I have all authority and power. Then a very simple command, go in my name. And last, a stunning promise. Again, I know there's a lot of alliteration here. I thought it was cool when I wrote it. Now it seems cheesy, but you get the idea. A stunning promise. He says, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. I'm with you always. Let's talk about that for a minute. That is the singular central promise of the word of God from start to finish. From Genesis to Revelation, God's promise is to be with us. In Genesis chapter 1, he creates a people to be. He walks with them in the cool of the day, dwelling with them in, until sin breaks that union. But he was with us, and we've been longing for him ever since. In Deuteronomy, he says, I will be with you, my people. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 41, he promises, I'll never leave you or forsake you. In Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, and he says, I will be strong and courageous. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you wherever you go. All throughout the Old Testament, and then we come to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, we read the, the quoting of the prophet Isaiah, the virgin will be with child, and she will give birth, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then the book of Hebrews, and, and throughout the New Testament, he's promised to be with us, and all the way to Matthew 28, I'm with you always to the end of the age, and then in Revelation 3, now the dwelling of God is with men. I'm with you. From start to finish, God's desire is to be with us, and the desire of our hearts, even though it gets confused, is to know we're not alone, to know he's with us. And these are the last words Jesus speaks in the flesh before he ascends to heaven. His last words to his followers, I'm with you. I'm with you. I have all authority and all power. Behind this going is the very nature and power and presence of God, the Trinity, the triune God. And I'm with you, you're not alone. Go, I go with you. Go, I've got your back, I'm behind you. Go, I'm already there ahead of you. Go, I'm surrounding you and I'm protecting you. Walking in here, you know, I preached this at the, at the East Campus a moment ago and I drove over here and walking in that back door, someone was walking out of the previous service and they said, that was a great sermon, but how do I know where to go? Great question. He doesn't say. He just says go. My suggestion would be, I think it's better to go than to worry about where. You get paralyzed wondering about where. He says to all the nations. Well, let's start with your neighborhood. What does it mean? Knock on doors and say, if you were to die tonight, you know where you'd be? That sounds mildly threatening, doesn't it? Like, that's weird. No, love people. Go, go. You want to, how many of you would, would like to know, not intellectually, but in your soul, deep down, know for certain you're not alone, that there is a God and he's really, truly with you? How many of you would like to know that in a more powerful way than you do right now? I would. I want you to pay attention to something. Jesus says, go, I'm with you. Perhaps those things go together in a very powerful way. Think back over your life. When have you experienced the power and presence of God? 
My guess is for many of us, it's in times of insecurity, pain, difficulty. When we felt in some way that we needed him, he showed up. I think Jesus is saying, you're not going to experience my presence. Doesn't mean I'm not present, but you're not going to experience it the way you could until you put yourself in a position where you need me. Until you reach out in some way where you feel dependent on me. Until you do that, it's just theoretical, intellectual. But if you take some step of faith to build a relationship, to pray for someone, to give, to serve, to put yourself out there, to go in some way that makes you feel slightly insecure, slightly ill-equipped, then you'll know that I'm with you in a way you wouldn't otherwise. You know, that, that little plan to change the world, 11 guys, half of them with, with doubt in their heart. It worked. Think about that. Rodney Stark wrote a book called The Triumph of Christianity, examining how is it possible from a secular historical point of view that this little movement called Christianity trumped the Roman Empire and changed the Western world, and now today, 40% of the world's population identifies themselves as Christians of whatever stripe or, or, or denominational uh, tradition. It's, it's, it's stunning. Historians and sociologists can speculate and offer their own opinions, but I think we know the words of Jesus in Matthew 28 are true. All authority belongs to me. Never forget that. I'll never leave you. I'm always with you. Now go. Let's pray. Father, we confess to you that we are uh, often timid and weak souls. Nervous and obsessed about the little mundane events of our, our daily lives. And we know that you care about the details, God, of our lives, but you have so much more in store for us. And so, God, in this world where so many things compete for the allegiance of our heart, remind us that you alone have all authority and power, and you alone are worthy of our worship and our praise. And God, as you give us opportunities to go, build a relationship, share a kind word, spread the love of your gospel, that we would remember that we go in your name, in your strength, and because of you. And we have nothing to fear. We thank you, God, that you went, you came to save us. May we go in the same way into the world. By your strength and power, we praise you, Jesus. Amen.